What a man needs for gardening, a 19th century realist observed, is a cast iron back with a hinge in it. But despite the back-breaking nature of their labors, the English have pursued their gardening with indefatigable energy for the best part of a thousand years. For much of that time, those who wanted gardens were just a few wealthy people, while those who labored to create them were numerous and poor. Plenty of cheap labor and lots of land. Which is why for many years the English garden was about the size of a park. Yes, and a very big park too. Gardens, like buildings, reflect the period in which they were created. Someone evidently decided that this, the Jubilee Garden, would be a fitting contribution to the 1970s, and over a quarter of a million pounds was spent here. The result is perhaps appropriate to its surroundings. Sitting here, it is certainly very difficult to believe that our gardens were once the envy of Europe. The marshes and downs of England must always have looked like this, even before man came to till the soil. But it is the soil of this country, rich and infinitely varied, as well as our despised but temperate English climate, that has made it possible for us to grow the incredible variety of trees and plants that we have collected over the centuries. These programs, however, are not about the plants themselves, but about the way they have been used in the design of our gardens. Gardens varying in size from a small enclosure within the walls of a medieval castle to a great landscape garden. Indeed, some of the time, we shall be looking at scenes that are difficult to imagine as being gardens at all. Even primitive man decorated the land on a grand scale. The White Horse of Uppington is enormous, so huge that four people can stand comfortably in its eye. Nobody knows who created the White Horse or why. It's an effective decoration to the landscape all the same. Flowers grew there too, of course. And these are some of the native flowers of England. Primrose, harebell, buttercup. Gentle in color, restful to the eye.
Many of them are still grown today, though now we have to buy them in boxes from the nursery, and others we consider as weeds and pull them up. The spraying of crops and the destruction of hedgerows have caused flowers like the humble cowslip to be classed as an endangered species. There were no native cereal crops, so the Celts in their villages had to import them, accidentally bringing with them at the same time seeds of flowers like the poppy and the cornflower. Another import came from the Mediterranean, also perhaps by accident. This is the woad plant. Woad was not grown to eat, but pick the leaves, dry them and ferment them, and it was said had a plentiful supply of urine, and you could have a smelly but very efficient blue dye. Painted on the body, woad may have been used to create some form of protection against disease, but most people believe it was used to frighten the enemy. And indeed, it could be very frightening. All the Britons paint themselves in woad, wrote Julius Caesar in 55 BC. The country is more remote than anywhere else in the world, added Horace. But the Britons are so very unpleasant to strangers. The crops, claimed Tacitus, germinate late and sprout up quickly due to the terrific dampness of the air. England's new Roman masters brought their culture with them, and of course that meant their gardens too. We can see what a Roman town garden might have looked like from this reconstruction at Pompeii in Italy. The chances of any Englishman getting a job in a Roman garden were slender. I shouldn't buy slaves from Britain, wrote one Roman. They're incredibly stupid and quite incapable of learning. They don't belong in any decent household. The Romans bequeathed more than just a great wall. They left a legacy of plants, onions, leeks, cabbages, turnips, peas, celery and the radish, fruits like the cultivated apple, the vine and the fig, the sweet chestnut and the common walnut. When the Romans left in the 5th century, the country was plunged into what has been called the Dark Ages. Christianity came to England about 150 years after the Romans left. Monasteries and convents were founded all over the country, a country where only 20% of the land was cultivated. And they provided sanctuary for the civilized arts, which of course included gardening. The monks grew fruit in the orchards and vegetables in the fields to feed the brethren. But the monasteries were much more than self-supporting religious institutions. For 500 years, they were to be the custodians of the country's precarious culture, and they were to pursue scientific knowledge too. The medieval monasteries were the only hospitals at the time. The medicines the monks used were derived from the herbs they grew, and in illustrating their herbals, they became the first botanical painters. These are pages from the herbal made in the Abbey of Bury St. Edmunds in the late 11th century. Despite its name, a herbal was very much a gardening encyclopedia. It included all kinds of advice for growing things. For example, the crocus is produced about hedges and in foul places, or the strawberry is produced in secret places and in clean ones. When it came to the herbs themselves, they were more specific. Watercress rubbed into the nose was a cure for baldness. Road was used to take the sting out of snake bites. One herbal recommends against lice, pound in ale oak rind and a little wormwood give to the lousy one to drink. Odium Castle in Sussex is a late medieval castle, and if a moated castle had a garden, it would have had it inside the walls. The tiny castle garden provided the only opportunity for fresh air. Here are people sitting round a fountain, and through the gate on the right is a small herb and flower garden. 
This woman is sitting on a turf seat, a thick brick wall turfed on the top. Above this turf seat, a simple trellis supports climbing plants. The sort of tools they used then did much the same jobs as our garden implements today, though their design is sometimes rudimentary. This spade is at least recognizable, made entirely of wood, with only a section of the blade sheathed in iron, and will probably have been less reliable to use than today's implement would be. The moated castle was designed around small courtyards, principally, of course, intended for defense. A manor house like this one in Oxfordshire did not have the same defensive capabilities, though it was fortified. Originally, there would have been high walls just inside the moat, leaving quite a large enclosed area, which was the garden. The lawn to the right would have been the orchard. At Compton Wynyards in Warwickshire, built in the reign of Henry VIII, the moat is more for decoration. It is probably the first example of a great house designed without regard to defense. The garden was now far more important, a place to be enjoyed. These pictures from a later hurdle concentrate on flowers with vegetables and herbs taking a less important role. A larger garden could provide more than the essential vegetables and herbs. It is interesting that this herbal is in the form of an ABC for instruction and amusement of the young. At about this time, the first proper gardening books began to appear. The most famous, The Gardener's Labyrinth by Thomas Hill. The book includes designs for gardens laid out in the shape of complex knots. There is a story that a certain Duke of Buckingham invented an ingenious knot with which to hang two men at the same time. Laid out in the form of a square, it made an interesting pattern. Later designs of knots became very much more complex, using a variety of plant material to make patterns for the first time. This recently reconstructed knot garden in Gloucestershire is a faithful replica taken from a contemporary book and planted according to the original instructions. The ground is covered in different colored gravels and the threads of the knot are made from dwarf box and wall germander. The threads interweave just like a real knot and the bushes were selected to provide further contrasts of color. Hill's book also illustrates another common feature of these gardens, the trellised arbor. This arbor at Mosley Old Hall provides a shaded walk to the orchard down two sides of a simpler form of knot garden. In this, the paths form the threads rather than the plants themselves. This passion for neatness extended to all parts of the garden. This man is planting out a bed in which the level of the earth is higher than the part surrounding it. The medieval practice of surrounding beds with planks of wood is still used in some vegetable gardens today, like this one at Cap Heaton in Northumberland. Before the invention of the hose, watering was a problem. This picture of an irrigation system from Hill's book is somewhat fanciful. But Hill's illustration for watering using a pump in a tub seems much more practical. The pippin apple was introduced at this time, so called because it grew from a pip and did not need grafting. 
It was fetched out of France by the king's gardener, writes a contemporary. But grafting was well understood in this period and even needed special tools. The maze, which is very ancient, did not start as a garden decoration. It is believed to have originated in churches as a line on a tiled floor along which a penitent had to walk while saying his prayers. The maze in this Rutland village is made of turf and gravel. More sophisticated designs for the garden could have been made of turf or low hedges. This pattern is not for a maze, but for a group of fish ponds in the garden, in which different types of fish would be bred in the various sections, and the island in each pond made it easier to net them. It is remarkable that one such fish pond still exists in Oxfordshire. Pigeons and doves were, like the fish, an important source of food. Their houses, usually circular like this one in the kitchen garden at Rasham, were treated decoratively, just as fish ponds were. Hundreds of birds would be bred in a dovecot like this. The dovecot at Dunham Massey was outside the walled gardens. Another feature that was both practical and decorative was the mount. The mount was originally used as a high defensive position just inside the first castellated wall. In the garden, the mount became a viewing platform from which to view the intricate patterns of the beds or the surrounding scenery. By the reign of the first Elizabeth, England was a relatively settled and prosperous country, eager to assimilate the new thoughts that were sweeping Europe from the Italian Renaissance. Montacute in Somerset was built in the 1590s. The house is a splendid example of the new Italianate architecture, which even extended into the garden. Garden architecture was to be a feature of the English landscape for the next 200 years. These garden pavilions with their balustrated walls surrounded the forecourt and the balustrades themselves are surmounted by small obelisks. Decorative Italian fountains like this one from Nonsuch Palace were often a source of some amusement. One of them, the foreign visitor said, had an excellent waterwork with which one may easily spray any ladies or others standing about and wet them well. Although this garden at Chasselton was originally laid out after the one at Montacute, the owners were a more conservative family. They could not afford elaborate garden buildings, so they decorated their garden with topiary. The Italianate garden was even to be found in distant Wales. Here at Clanersh, the terraced gardens are stepped down in a series of walled enclosures to the valley below. The gardens with their Italian cypress trees are embellished with numerous pavilions, elaborate staircases and fountains. The greatest Renaissance garden in England was here at Wilton. It was designed in 1632 by the first of the great garden designers to work in England, Isaac de Coe. The garden's most important feature was its grotto. Inside it must have looked very much like this grotto by de Coe at Woburn. De Coe, a French Huguenot, was also an expert in hydraulics, and the fountains in his grottoes, it is said, did not merely spray people, but they could also make bird calls, balance colored balls in the air, and perform all kinds of other amazing tricks.
The garden in this picture must have been a source of pride to its owners. They clearly just had it laid out in the Italian style, which lasted throughout the reign of Charles I. This garden too was laid out in 1621 to a formal pattern, but it is a garden with a particular purpose. It was the first botanical garden in England, Oxford and behind its gates, plants and flowers were scientifically studied and propagated. And they were to be painted in a decorative way for the first time by Alexander Marshall. Tulips figure prominently in Marshall's paintings. For the next 50 years, interest in the tulip was to be more than just a fashion. In Holland, it became a mania. A single bulb of a new variety would cost as much as 25,000 pounds in today's money. But the English were not such slaves to fashion and Marshall painted many other simpler flowers. Sadly, there is no complete original garden left from those early times. However, one garden at least succeeds in capturing the spirit, feeling and atmosphere of the early 17th century. It is a reconstruction at Beckley in Oxfordshire. The Elizabethan Empire, so rich in trade and commerce, might have been said to lay the foundation of a new golden age. Yet who would have guessed, looking at the lavish sophistication of the court of Charles I, that it was to be a false dawn? The man who was destined to follow Charles I was not much interested in earthly glories. Under the gloomy protectorate of Cromwell, the English garden ceased to develop. For its next flowering, it had to wait until the return from exile of Charles's brilliant son. <laughs> 